Hi there, Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. Well, a career spanning five decades judging. That definitely makes you the Gordie Howe dog judges. Today on the interview chair, Mr. Jim Reynolds. Hi, everybody. We're here today with everybody's favorite, Mr. Jim Reynolds. Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm well, Will. How about you? I'm good. It's great to see you. Good uh, to see you. There are better places we could be, like a show, but anyway. Exactly. That's what I was just going to ask. How's the pandemic treating you? Um, I'm bored, as you can imagine. I have not done a show since March, and all my other shows were canceled. On the other hand, I have three children and grandchildren around to keep me busy, so I'm babysitting a lot. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so they are keeping you busy, I'm sure. Until school starts, then of course we'll all be in lockdown for a while. Yeah, for sure. For sure. How's the weather there today? Miserable. It's overcast, uh, gray. On the other hand, we've had such a fantastic summer that I refuse to complain until the snow falls. Then I'll complain. Well, it's chilly up here. I have a sweater on today, so. Well, that's what happens when you get older. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's get started. <laughs> Tell me how you got involved in dogs and the sport of dogs, Jim. Even when I was little, I always wanted something alive when I asked for Christmas presents, etc. And my parents always obliged. And so I was showing animals from the time I was eight and nine years old, not dogs. In the end, what happened was I had a flock of sheep that I was highly successful with, but took a lot of land. My father wanted the land back, and so I was offered the opportunity to get a show dog. And so that was the start of it all. Um, and I ended up going to some shows, and uh, then I ended up with a dog, a uh, Boston Terrier, actually, which is my oh, father's dog. Yeah. Yeah called Iowana's Fancy Sheriff from a top leader in the United States. And I went to my first show, and I was so young that I had to have a driver because I didn't have a driver's license. And that show was the Canadian Save the Children Fund show. And you talk about serendipity. At that show, there was a beautiful blonde woman who ran it, and Selling, who would become a great friend, and who, of course, yeah. won Westminster twice. There was a lady with a lot of scrappy little dogs that, who knew what that was about, Betty Hislop with Karen Terriers, who was a dominant influence in my whole dog show life. She had a friend of her with her, Celeste Hutton, who got me involved with Irish Wolfhounds, my great love. Oh, and there was a young man who accompanied in his convertible from university from Watertown, Tom Bradley. <laughs> you can imagine, and that was my first dog show. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So how old were you then? I was not 16. I was 15 then. Um, I had done, actually, when they showed the animals, I, when I was 11 years old, I won a grand champion ram. Ah. And they put me on the cover of the two leading uh, agriculture magazines in Canada. Wow. So that was pretty heady stuff when you're 11. Well, for and sure. so showing animals and winning with animals has always been rather important to me. Mm. I didn't know that. That's a great story. Um, so you met you met all those people there. That was the first dog show. So was who who was your first mentor then in the sport of dogs? You know, I knew you were going to ask about that, and it's really interesting because I really was on my own all the way through. Even though uh, when I moved into Scottish Terriers, which was my choice. Um, I wasn't, and Fred Fraser was here in this area, Bob Sharp, but that really wasn't the ties. The, the really important person was Hislop, Mrs. Hislop. Okay. Now, people probably don't even remember Betty in some cases, but she dominated North America with Karen Terriers, 22 successive best of breeds at Westminster, 250 champions. 
And she would often ask me to drive her to shows, which meant I could show my dog also. For sure. But also, we would have dinner maybe every couple of weeks. And she not only bred all these good dogs, she imported the top dogs from Britain. And so I had the opportunity to go over all kinds of really good dogs and learn that way. And in some cases, it was great because Betty brought things in, not necessarily always of a type that she liked, but of the ones that could win. And so I learned early on that there are different types in a breed. And you have to learn to appreciate that and not become blind. If there's a better mousetrap, go with the better mousetrap. It's a good way of putting it, sir. <laughs> so, so Betty was your, was your first influence. Oh, I would say she was the first important person in mentoring in uh, dogs. There was also a lady, uh, we went to McMaster University and then I taught two years in Hamilton, a lady called Joan Morton. Oh, yes. And again, Morton. Joni and I would go to shows together, uh, and I was in the Hamilton area. And she was also an important influence uh, in just the idea of how to conduct yourselves at dog shows. I know who Joan Morton is. Can you, can you tell the viewers who Joan Morton is? Some of them may not know who she is. So. Joan was a breeder of miniature schnauzers. Tannenbaum was her kennel name. And she bred not only top winning dogs, but she also... Um, went down into the United States a lot and to bring in good breeding stock. And she again was a lady. She conducted herself always immaculately in the ring. And of course went on to judge and do a lot of very successful judging. Um, she died far too early as far as I was concerned. And she was also a great friend to a lot of people. As a matter of fact, one day I was coming out of the Ottawa Kennel Club show in November and she pointed out a young man in a fur jacket and said, you know, he's going to be really important. He's in my handling classes. And I was Dick Mean. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a lot of influence with a lot of people, but always genuine, always willing to help. I'm sure. So we have, we have Betty Hislop and Joan Morton. Was there more from there? There had to be more. I, I know how the dog Actually, a lot of the time what happened was that, uh, as I say, I started driving with Betty. And that was a key to introducing me to a lot of tremendous people. I'm sure, yes. And I met a lot of friends along the way and made a lot of friends. One of the key ones was Mrs. Ellis, who ran and owned the Chicago International. And I would go there when we had the Karen specially, and Mrs. E would have me ring steward sometimes. And one of the people I ring steward for was Mrs. Augustus Riggs IV, Adelaide Riggs, an Albury judge. Again, a great lady, and she really was the key to my beginning to judge in the United States. Um, for some reason, she liked me, recognized that I was interested in dogs. And one day the phone rang. And this man was on the phone, said his name was Chuck O'Neill. I had no clue who Chuck O'Neill was. But Mrs. Riggs had no longer able to fill an assignment at Bryn Mawr, and would I be willing to take her assignment? Well, Chuck O'Neill, of course, is Mary Beth's father. He was chair of the board of the AKC. <laughs> I went to Bryn Mawr, judged there, not knowing I was being watched by Jack Marvin, B. Marvin, Doc Dubler. And that was really the beginning of my show career as a judge in the United States. And what year would that have been, Jim? Uh, that would have put us into the early 70s. Okay. Because I did my first best in show at Montgomery County in 76. So uh, it was... Wow, that's great. You know, I, I, I see the eyebrows go well. You have to recognize this is my 53rd year as a licensed judge, confirmation judge. Well, I, I, in 76, I'm not even sure I've met you yet. I was only 11. <laughs> I probably had, though. <laughs> this is, uh, well, I, have a, I think a cute story with Jody Paquette because she uh, was at a show uh, in Montgomery County much later. And I was doing Best in Show again. And she said, oh, Mr. Reynolds, you must be so thrilled to do Best in Show. And I said, yes, I am, Jody." And I told her when I'd done it the first time, she said, oh, Mr. Rells, I wasn't even alive then. <laughs> so I, I'm accustomed to people with these stories. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so 
Um, can you tell us when you when you started breeding the, the Scotties, Ronaldo? I started breeding Scotties in '62. I was uh, still at the university uh, at Carlton at that time, and brought a Scotty bitch from England and whelp from Kennelgarth Kennels, which was very famous, and whelp to a dog called Kennelgarth Viking. And unfortunately, there were four puppies, uh, four males. Two died, and the other two really were just not what I thought they should be. And so I moved from there. But my lucky break in Scotties came about in uh, 65. I was in Toronto, and there was an old terrier man there, Jack Trelevin. And Mr. T did a lot of winning with his different terriers, and he'd had a stroke. And in his kennel, he had a dog called Trelevin's Top Brass. And Topper had. 13 points in the United States, including best of winners at a big specialty in Kentucky. And had had some rough hand treatment by the guy who was looking after the dogs in the kennel. And so Mr. T sold me Topper. And I was able to get him around and show. He became my first best in show dog. I finished this American Championship. And then bred from that point in time on using Top Brass and uh, some stock from the Barbary No Kennels, which had Carmichael's fan there, the best of show winner at Westminster. And then just kept one to again have that little better mousetrap. And so I went to a number of shows and probably decided in the late, must have been 67 or a little later, I decided really I was tired of always having brindles because these were all brindle dogs. And uh, the, the kennel to get blacks in, this, no, it was, it was the early 70s, it was Ann Stam in Michigan. And so I talked to Buffy Stam, and I said, Buffy, you know, I would like a, a black dog puppy. And she said, Mr. Reynolds, because she didn't know me, and I really didn't know her. I do have a stud fee puppy uh, that I would sell you uh, for $1,000. Well, you have to remember, my wife and I had just been married. We were just starting out teaching. Um, so $1,000 was a lot of money. Sure. As I say, I got big from Buffy. And uh, that year in Canada, we were putting uh, prizes for dollars. A lot of money was involved. He won a best in show, best puppies in show. And so the upshot of it all was that I won $995. So he was my $5 dog. There you go. As my $5 dollar dog, he went on to sire several champion, American champion champions. He also... Uh, won several best in shows and was, uh, I think, third top terrier in Canada uh, without a lot of campaigning because I, it, it's hard for people to understand now. But if I went to 30 individual shows in a year, that was a lot of dog shows. Yeah. So I didn't, you know, the dogs were never campaigned the way people have to campaign now. It was never there. But he sired a, a lot of really good dogs for me. Um, and Basically, what had happened is I bought him to use with the daughters of a dog of mine called Total Score that I in, thought was about the epitome that I wanted. And Toto developed uh, throat cancer in uh, he was five years old. Oh, Jesus. And uh, had to be put down. We tried, we couldn't do anything. And so the upshot of it was I never really felt the same about it uh, after that about breeding the dogs. But by that time, I was judging. And the for me, judging, and the, the, the reason I judge, people have all kinds of reasons, but the reason I judge, I get an opportunity to get my hands on the best dogs in North America and other places. And for that moment, sometimes they belong to me. The odd time one of those dogs will just go to me and it's showing for me. My best example of that was uh, Pat Trotter's Gilda, the elk hound. And uh, Gilda could be a bit of an indifferent showman. But any time I was in the ring, she came and she looked at me and she stood and she was my dog. Indeed, one time, Pat just kind of went out to the end of her lead and said, I'll just leave you two alone. <laughs> <laughs> and it was those moments that I still enjoy every time it happens, along with just seeing what people are able to achieve and, and could breed. The Gilda story is rather interesting from the perspective of people wanting to know about judges and how judges can be the way they are. I had just given Gilda a group someplace and went back to sit down in the sin bin, you know, where all the judges sit, the sin bin. <laughs> and I was sitting between two judges who judged hounds. 
they weren't my friends, but they, I mean, they weren't close friends, but they were certainly licensed. They were very re reputable judges, but they never can resist talking. I don't know why people can't resist talking, but they can't. And so after a little while, the one turns to me, he's on one side, and he says, oh, Jim, I really loved your choice. Isn't it a shame that she's over, so over-angulated? Okay. And, you know, and a little while later, the guy on my other side, oh, Jim, really loved your choice. She's just so straight and stifle. <laughs> the standard says moderate. Guess what I thought she was? <laughs> and people don't understand that I sometimes I think the judges legitimately see things very differently. Oh, well, for sure. And when they make their choices, you wonder how that, they could make that choice. But if you see it through their eyes, you may not agree, but you, become, you understand a little bit more about what they actually are seeing. And you have to understand their background, too. Sometimes these judges come from a very different background uh, in terms of dogs. I was judging out of, out of Ventura on the Santa Barbara, when Santa Barbara was Santa Barbara in the old days. Um, and there was an English judge beside me, and she was famous for her top sporting dogs uh, and really well-respected. And then as she got up to leave, to go out to judge, she's sitting beside me, and she says, oh, well, when in Rome. And I thought, well, I wonder what that means. And out she goes, and Ray McGinnis comes into the ring with an Irish setter that was doing a tremendous amount of winning, a beautiful dog, and he won the group. And then I understand what in Rome means. Yeah. Because this lady knew that she was coming. Yes, they wanted her opinion as a gun dog judge, but she also understood that she had a responsibility to be aware of the American standard and the American way of presenting dogs. And so to recognize the quality that was there, even though she would never have thought of that as a dog for one of her breeding programs. And, you know, all these factors enter into when you're judging and into uh, the impressions you make. And, uh, and so I say, that's why I really I moved away from uh, breeding and exhibiting because I could only have done that in a very limited state. You know, uh, I had a career. Uh, my wife had a career. Um, we had three children. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the, <laughs> one of the things about, I should really say in this, uh, women have played a very important part in my life. My mother looked after all the litters. So all the puppies there. My wife, we met in university. We were in an English class and the professor cracked a rather smutty joke. Two people laughed, me and my wife. That's when we decided, I didn't know her at that point, but we decided maybe we had something in common. <laughs> We've been together for 57 years, so I guess we do. But she was never really involved with the dogs. Her parents wouldn't let her have a dog. And she knew that I took off in our university. I go to these things called dog shows, but it meant nothing to her. And then when we came to our wedding rehearsal, she and her father practiced going down one aisle in the church while the minister gated his Newfoundlands down the other aisle for me to look at. And that's when she knew dogs were serious. But she never backed out, but we stayed together. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. I made other, as I say, Adelaide Riggs was really important to me. And I, you probably know best through her daughter, uh, Ellen Charles, and all the hill with dogs. Yeah. Um, but along the way, uh, of course, probably one of my closest friends was Annie Clark. And we used to, I always talk, I, Annie I love to talk dogs with, and there we could talk dogs. Whenever I was at a show, she usually drove with me. And after the show, sometimes she would say, now can we talk about this without getting upset? <laughs> because we never argued, Annie and I never had an argument of that kind. We could talk about things and discuss it. And she was so knowledgeable in so many breeds. And we had our disagreements. Okay. I mean, she was always the frustrated handler. People would go in the ring and know, you I'm sure it happened to you. She'd decide that dog wasn't set up right and she was going to show you how to set it up. <laughs> I used to say, that's his job. It's not mine. And we get into this argument of whose role it was. You always told um, me to think on my feet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I do miss her. I mean, I, I, well, we always talked to after show weekends. And she would phone and uh, ask me, and I want, I want to get to the bottom line. If I'd done best in charge, I said, well, I put, no, no, seven dogs were in the ring. 
and then we had to work our way through each and every one of them. But, you know, that was, uh, it was a great learning experience there too, just in simply talking back and forth because she knew all the dogs. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. You know, she would know all the dogs. And, uh, and you do, and you have, and as I say, you have all these magic moments and you never know where you're going to have them. People will say, well, why are you going there at times? And I would, because I, you never know. And you actually were part of one of those episodes where we went to a town, I think it's called Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. A little town in Pennsylvania, a little dog show, 800 dogs. I'm doing best in show. I'm at my book at the, in the ring, and I hear your voice because, of course, you always forget the old school teacher, always know what's going on at the back of the class. <laughs> and your voice saying, well, now we know what he think, he'll think. And I turn around, and there you are with the beagle. And Rebecca is with the Scotty. So your beagle who went best in show at Westminster and the Scotty went best in show across in an 800 dog show in Pennsylvania. And <laughs> yeah. the excitement of it. That's the excitement. You never know whether I'm judging at Westminster, which of course is, well, I was the first uh, non American to judge best in show in Westminster since 1929 wow. when I did it. And by the way, the 1929 judge was a Canadian too, and that was the year the stock market crashed. So I was really happy that it took a couple of years for the market to crash after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it just uh, it was truly exciting. Although my favorite, and I've got to say this, I do any time, I've done over 70 American national breed specialties across all seven groups. And that is usually your become that judge based on votes from the membership. And that I think is a great tribute. I mean, I do enjoy my nationals and I've had some very exciting ones. Uh, four of the shows that were canceled this year were nationals. Oh. And we encourage that. But they've asked me back for other years, so I'll get to do them still. Oh, that's good. That's good. Back to Annie. When did, you, when did you meet Annie and how did you, how did you two meet? <laughs> oh. Annie and I met in the 60s. Yeah. And I, uh, late 60s, where I was at a show, and I wanted to see if she would come to cars to judge. And so I just walked up to her. Well, of course, walking up to Annie, for me, was easier. Uh, <laughs> we kind of looked each other eye to eye and, and said, she said, well, yes, that would be fine sometime. And then... It really was afterwards, I was judging, I did the last national, especially when Norwich and Norfolk were one breed. They split into the two breeds after that. Wow. And my winner's bitch was a, a drop ear, as we call it, drop ear bitch and Norfolk bitch. The Damer was showing. And after it was all through, she said, this one belongs to Annie. And I thought, oh, I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> Whereupon, um, I had covered myself with glory there, and it was fine. So, uh, and then we just started talking, and, and we just, we, we saw a lot of things alike, and we enjoyed each other's company. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, part of that was the fact that, you know, sometimes people would forget. And she enjoyed being Mrs. Clark. But to me, she was Annie, and I think she enjoyed being Annie sometimes and didn't have to be Mrs. Clark. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then it was a group of them. Uh, Annie didn't show herself dogs to me. Janie and Bob did. Uh, Michelle did. And these became my closest friends. That was another reason I stopped doing, showing dogs. The people I respected, I, if I respected them, I really felt, uh, why would I... Put them in that situation people would know they're my friends and so if i win it's the wrong reason it reflects on them and i know it wouldn't be the wrong reason i would be given a hard time but one time mrs clark was judging a sportsman show and i got an english cocker spaniel and decided to go to sportsman show and finish and annie was judging there so i go in the ring and i go i think winner's bitch maybe no i won the class and Annie says to me, is Marcia here? This is my wife, is she here? And I said, well, no, uh, she's not at the show. She's shopping. Back in, I come for winners. 
can you get her to get me some pantyhose? There's a fancy dinner tonight and I don't have any. And so out I go. And I then went to my wife's store and the clerk was there and she said, I said, uh, I need some black pantyhose. And she looks at me and she says, what size? I said, well, queen size. <laughs> Never went back to that store. <laughs> But, you know, we had fun. We, we, yeah. we had fun together. And uh, as I say, I miss that tremendously. And the same with Janie and Bob. Janie, the first time I met Janie was, I didn't meet her, I was judging in Philadelphia and she was showing boxers. And when it came time to do best of winners, I didn't split the major. I went the way I wanted to go. And as I go back to my book, I hear this gravelly voice coming, he's a mean man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hear that voice. <laughs> you know, the other thing, you will remember this. You remember the uh, Dennis, the Irish setter? Yes. The okay. And Jeannie, I, I have a statue. Back. That seemed right there. <laughs> well, Janie was the first handled that dog. And I was judging down in Pennsylvania in September. And Janie sent the dog in with George Alston. And at that time, there was a beautiful bitch being shown. I think her name is Oriental Jade. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was really competitive. And so along comes Janie then, after I'm judging, and wants to change dogs. And I won't let her in the ring. Will you talk about fumes rising? Because I, I love Dennis. And, of course, I put Dennis up and later I put him best in show. But, you know, again, long relationships with these people who were friends. And that made it a lot of fun in terms of, I, I miss, sometimes when I go to the shows, uh, I think, okay, it would have been so much more fun if, if some of the same, the old group were there. Yeah. You know, and, but they're not. And so you, you go on with it, but you learned a lot. You learned a lot in that kind of discussion. So getting back to your concept of mentors, we have people who set themselves out to be mentors and they work really hard. In some ways I felt experience with a lot of different people and listening to what they were saying and seeing what they were doing was a much better form of mentorship than having somebody try to browbeat me into the 22 points of an Irish setter. True, makes a lot of sense. I, even, even myself as, as a handler, I was, I was a lot of people that I looked to, to mentoring. There's, obvi there's obvious ones that I, I went to like George and Brian and Gary, but, but, there was so many that I watched. I remember Bobby Sten Stebbins used to send me off to watch different handlers every time I had a break, you know. So, so to give you and a number of people of your age range, when I started, hand no, and this is positive, when I started showing dogs, the handlers were a pretty ragged group and some pretty ragged things happened, okay? You belong to a whole group of young people who were serious and came in, and I took great delight in watching you and the progress, but they did exactly what you're saying. You went to different places, you watched different things, and you learned from that. There's no question. And, and uh, that was important. Like, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy watching what people are able to do, and I enjoy giving them a hard time if I don't think they're doing as well as they can do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's always fun entering your ring because I never know what to expect. So. Oh, and that, you know, was a part of it. I mean, that's, but you do, uh, you know, I've been privileged to do uh, 16, I've judged Westminster 16 times, okay? Uh, there's three of us up in that, that group. But again, you never know what to do. I was doing Old English Sheepdogs uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. And suddenly I realized my ring was filling up, like the outside around the spectators were filling up. I thought, what? Because I had one dog, one class dog, because they just started using class dogs, one class bitch and 18 specials. And of course I turned around and there is this specials dog and it's Colton showing the dog and his family have known him. I've been doing it since they were kids. And I knew the dog was made for me. I mean, that was all there was to it. And he, of course, went on to win the breed and then went on to reserve best in show yeah. and that was swagger and as i say you never know and that's the excitement of it at least for me that's the excitement of it. oh no question but yeah do you have other dogs in your 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 bank I mean, in your head that were oh wow dogs when they came in 
Oh, uh, from the past, obviously. Yes, I know. That's how I was. I was trying to do a little bit of elimination right in my own mind right now of certain dogs that I could say that about, but don't want to you know, at this point in time. And I, you know, one of the things that is difficult at times is people say, "Oh, I remember when." And your memory may not be there. It may not be right. If you saw the dog now, you would say what? But the first dog that I ever saw, that it was in Chicago International, it was in the mid '60s, and Bobby Barlow came in the ring called uh, the pointer called Shandon Touch of Kings, and I thought I had been just struck by lightning. Yeah. Along the way, there's been other dogs like that, and but you see them later, or if you actually do look at the videos, you think, oh, "Wait a second here, what was I doing about that?" Because you are always learning. I mean, if you are judging, you are always learning. And things evolve, so it just... And, and, and you have to pay attention to that. Yeah. Mrs. Hislop gave me a number of dog annuals, which was like a huge catalog in, in the UK, in Great Britain, from the 20s and the 30s. And let me tell you, if you the dominant kennel in Pekingese in the 20s were the Mrs. Ashton Cross, uh, Alderburn Pekingese. And... If you saw those dominant Pekingese today, you weren't even be sure what they were yeah. compared to what we have done to the breed and what some of our breeders have done. You know, Nigel and Bill clearly, but of course uh, in the States, uh, tremendous breeders. And so you can't always say the past. Things do evolve. Right. Do they always evolve for the best? Not necessarily, but they evolve. But even you talk about those Pekingese, probably if you went back and you looked at them, I'm sure you'd find the virtues that, that people found back then. They just may not be as... They, they didn't have the glamour. And, and indeed, it's interesting when you have all the uh, concern about breeding and in the FCI countries, etc. And clearly these dogs had more of a nose. And these dogs would not have the breeding problems. And so you could say, wait a second, that was a good thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. But is it that beautiful, Ed? No. <laughs> and can you find always, sometimes in the ring you're doing, you know, somebody would come up to me, not so much anymore, but they would come up and say, oh, I didn't think that dog was pretty enough for you. And then another would say, I didn't think that dog was sound enough for you. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I want both. And so I sometimes have to compromise to get one to the other. But you really uh, do have to make this balance and, and choosing what you're doing. And you have to go back to the origins of the breed. I'm going to be much harder on an unsound sporting dog or an unsound working dog than I am on an unsound toy or even some of my hounds. Uh, but you do go to what the breed was for. And it should be there in the back of your mind always. Uh, I don't mean for right up front when you're saying, oh, this can possibly, but it should be, you should be aware of that. But there's so many things you have to be aware of. You also have to be aware sometimes of just how hard Boston Terriers, as I told you, is where I started. I swear Boston Terriers, and I'm not sure it's James Evans, don't breed true. It seems very difficult to get a uniform litter of Boston Terriers. Whereas that isn't true of some of your other breeds. You get certain breed and they all look more or less alike, the individual differences. And so you have to be aware of that. And if you've got a litter of choice of 15 in some breeds, and you're getting one or two pups in other breeds, okay, you have to be aware of just how much more difficult it is to produce that X dog as opposed to maybe the Y dog. Um, and then the other time I would get a little annoyed is people will come... I've listened to judges and say, oh, those are such terrible dogs. Well, they're not terrible dogs. They maybe aren't what you would want. But as I said to a group of principals at one point in time, um, who were complaining about some of the behavior of the children again, and I said, you know, parents aren't keeping the good ones home. They sent you what they have. And so in terms of the kennels, they're not keeping the good ones home. They're bringing what they've got. And sometimes it's better than others, but you also have to stick with them through it. Especially, it's hard to be a breeder of dogs in this day and age. You know, and you, you have to applaud what they're doing, even if sometimes they get into difficulties. They can't have the huge cows. Like, Betty usually had 50 or 60 Karens. 
Okay, and they were well looked for after all the way through till they were 18 and 19. They seemed to live forever. <laughs> okay, but she could do that. And so you had opportunities to try things, which it's much harder now. People only have a few dogs that they breeding stock. And one mistake in a breeding program, and so do you then just erase the whole thing or do you say, well, maybe I can fix it and get into some more difficulty, or sometimes you erase it and fix the problem. If it's a small problem, fine. If it's a health problem, not so fine. Yep, that was no question. And now looking back, are there dogs in your past or that, that you remember that you wished you could have judged or been a part of? I think that is very difficult. They would have to be so far back because I really was and have been very, very fortunate that most of the dogs have, been, have crossed my path that I would really like and admire. Yeah. Um, and so I can't think of one right off the top. I will sit at ringside and watch at times and uh, think, okay, I would do this differently, but I may get a chance to do it differently. Uh, at some point in time, but it's very seldom. There are sometimes I've been places that I wished a certain dog won and it didn't, and I am I'm thinking, okay, now Jim, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I again, and this goes way, way back to the old days of the Metropolitan Kennel Club, and I'm judging the toy group, and I'm at my book, and I look up. And there's Elaine and a few other people that should be behind me in the ring showing dogs, but they're not. <laughs> and I must admit, I turned around and thought, how did this happen? Not but you, then it's my responsibility to deal with it as I deal with it. So yeah, sometimes they would change it. Sometimes there's key places that I would want to get a hands on a certain dog. I'm anticipating getting my hands on a certain dog. Swagger is a good example. Um, I put him best to show someplace in California, and a few weeks later, I'm in Arizona. And he is there, and I'm thinking, well, unfortunately, this is kind of a done deal because I really like this dog. I would say I like this dog, and uh, the herding group judge had not heard that, and so Swagger walked. <laughs> so I came to best in show and found a new dog, which I liked. And then the next day, there was a judge doing the Terrier Group, and no, it was doing the Best in Show, who we knew loved this particular Terrier, and that was a fait accompli. Only the Terrier judge hadn't heard either. <laughs> and so the Terrier didn't get through, and lo and behold, that judge then had to go out and find a dog, and she found the same dog I'd found the day before. Uh, that dog went on to 50 best in shows. This was not a bad dog, went on to some 50 best in shows. But that's the other side of the coin. If you don't enter, you can't win. Okay. Because if that handler had ever been told with this dog that did the winning, he was going to go best in show under both of us, these judges two days, and he said, you're out of your feeble mind. But the client said you're going to enter, and he didn't. That's what happens. Yeah. Worked out. Yeah, I know there's always cases where you have certain dogs, and I, yeah, I always like you would want that dog to get to so and so, and that dog never did. You know, that's of course. You know. Well, that was a great example of that was a dog that Michael Canalizo used to show, and he desperately wanted to get this dog to me for best in show, and we were several shows, and he couldn't get the dog to me. It, and so and he, one day I, he said, I'm so damn tired sitting watching you do best in show, you know? So then we come to the show where he cannot lose the group. There's no question I'm going to get these, going to get this dog to me. Except the judge developed appendicitis the night before. And so one more time, the dog didn't get to me. So yes, <laughs> you never know. I never did get to judge best in show with this particular dog. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> um, you still have goals in the sport, Jim? I think you've reached everything you've wanted to reach, but you never know. I probably, uh, I would say for me, it's just it's the the next chance and the next dog. That's that really is. I, I think. Some people want to get all the travel 
if I want to travel for fun, I travel for fun. It has nothing to do with dogs. I've had some great opportunities when I've traveled, but I, I traveled to see the dogs, not to see the temple down the street. I just happened to be part of it. And I'm always waiting to see what that night, next one is going to be. And I've got to say that when we were closing out this thing, COVID thing, what happened, the last couple of years, we've had some highly competitive dogs. Oh, yes. And I've seen beautiful ones. And there is one I would like to see, which I, well, I might if we ever get back to judging dog shows. Um, but it, it, that's, that's what it's about. I mean, it really isn't... Uh, and personal goals, you know, well, what else are you going to do? I've done, I've done all the top shows. I've, and all, I love doing nationals anytime, but nationals, and that's always exciting. You know, the year I did uh, Standard Poodles, I did the Poodle Club of America, I did Standard Poodles. It was a phenomenal year with the group of dogs I had in there. And in the end, my dog, breed dog, went best in show. And normally, then the opposite sex would go to one of the other varieties and didn't. Went to my standard, another standard I put up, who was a, England's dog of the year, which wasn't the dog of the year, then was in that ring. It was, you know, that's the tremendous excitement of, of nationals can do this for you. And there you can usually stick to type. Yeah. You know, um, that one, that is one of the joys of it. You can say, okay, this is, you know, I can set the type that I want here. And, and I'll stick with that, and that's the way it's going to be. The smaller shows, and especially our shows in Canada, but the smaller shows in the United States too, it's much harder because you've got 20 or 25 dogs, and it's much harder to have them of the same type unless they come out of the same kennel. And that isn't usually the experience you get into sort of thing. And, and, uh, but no, I, I've gotten really... I've, been, it's been great. It's been a, I've had a tremendous hobby. And that's always been, it's been my hobby. I think that's something, and many people have no idea about that either. I mean, they really, I don't know how, the number of people think I used to be a handler, I loves I wasn't, or they, they don't know where I came, because it's been a long time, as I say, 53 years. Yeah. And I probably haven't shown a dog for 43 of those. You know, I did for about the 10-year overlap. But, uh, and you never know you, what opportunity and then the P, and you meet great people. I mean, I, I've met all kinds of people that I have a lot of fun with. I mean, and that's, I miss that. This is what I miss here. In being in this restricted environment, uh, I don't get to, to chat. Okay. Well, the way you and I are chatting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and... It's like, and I, I'm really not one, I like the, the, the person to person. I would much rather be sitting talking to you. I don't want a virtual dog show. I like the synergy of being in the ring, having my hands on the dog, watching the handler's face, trying to get the dog right, having that whole dynamic going on as opposed to kind of the flat screen. And so I hope that it does end at some point in time. I'm going to do my first show in November, which I was very fortunate in because, and I was supposed to be in the States, but I canceled that one because of this current uh, two-week quarantine when we return. For me to be away for a week and then a two-week quarantine really is not easy to do. It's difficult. And uh, that opened up a, an opening, and so I'm going to be judging a show in Saskatchewan. Oh. And I am looking forward to that no end. Uh, it's one day and then all the rest of it to get back. And I have not seen dogs out there for a long time. Because as you know, I usually only do two or three Canadian shows a year. And so uh, it is going to be a lot of fun. All I have to do is get on and off the plane. The key isn't the show. The worry is not the shows. I think our dog people are being really great in trying to get back to shows. Yeah, they are. I feel safe there. It's the airplanes, it's the hotels, it's the restaurants in, in the wrong area. And the, the shows I was supposed to be doing uh, next week were in, in Florida. This is a terrible time in Florida. And you've got the um, go back to school, too. I mean, none of us know how that's going to turn out. Right. And so we have all these things, but we just keep hoping. But I, I am looking forward. And maybe somebody is going to come into the ring with something that I've never seen before, and I'm going to say, yay, it was worth the trip. There you go. <laughs> I hope so, too, for you.
do you have any advice for up and coming judges, Jim? Keep your mouth shut and watch what's going on. I must admit, um, I sit and watch sometimes, and then there else maybe go sit outside. And, and uh, you've got these people who decide that they want to pontificate. I'm into the younger judges. And the younger judges, you don't have to listen, obviously, or at least hear. I think make your own mind up about things, as in the case of the L count. Moderate is what I wanted, and I go with moderate. So I take a look. Somebody says it's straight. Somebody says it's over, uh, done. And I still look again and say, nope, you two are wrong. I was right to begin with. <laughs> but I think that's an important thing for people to listen, but then to go and just not take it. Uh, especially because some of the worst people in trying to influence are the worst judges. I think they're trying to reassure themselves that they've done a good job, and so they try to belabor how great that dog is they just had their hands on. And that's why quite often I don't sit in the sin bins. <laughs> the sin bins. If you could uh, talk to the 20-year-old Mr. Reynolds, Jim Reynolds, is there any advice you'd give him now? You know... That, that, is, that one is difficult. I've been so lucky. And maybe there would have been ways of working at it. But I, I've relied on, on, as I said, on luck and, and serendipity, and it worked out well for me. Uh, people used to, when I was lecturing teachers sort of thing, and they were coming up to coming teachers, and they'd ask me about my career ladder. Is if I planned this career I got into in education, because I emerged as a superintendent, which is kind of a book. And I didn't have one. And I really didn't have in the dog world either. I bore easily. And I'm nosy. And so when you get bored with something, look for something else. <laughs> that was basically, probably I should have had more faith in what it could have been. On the other hand, I was pretty young when I did all of this. You know, when I did my, I judged my first show, I was 25. Wow. I've been judge, I've been showing dogs for 10 years, but I was 25 when I judged, and that's young. That is uh, But again, they were small shows, and you got to see, and you had to stay all day. I was invariably winning something. Canadian bread, I used to hate Canadian bread. I used to go <laughs> second in the group and best Canadian bread and have to stay all day and know I was never going to get in the best in show week because the best of Joe dog would be another breed. But you do learn if you watch and observe and have people around you. I was at a show, um, you may have been there, I can't, in Woodstock last February, and there were a group of uh, people sitting around outside the ring as there usually are. But you could learn, uh, they were having fun. Uh, I'm not sure I needed to overhear all their conversations, but they were. <laughs> but in there, there were things that you could pick up and listen to if you wanted to, and find out about a dog and about. And it would be objective. You know, it would be fun, but it would be objective too. So I think I I wish I had more opportunity to do that. I just lucked in. As I say, I lucked in at that Can Save show. That was all there was to it. No, for sure, yeah. Uh, my oh, I will tell you one other funny thing about that. Mr. Bradley, as you know, is show chairman of Westminster. And I was having lunch with Mr. Bradley many years ago, and he handed me an envelope. And I opened the envelope and I said, oh, Tom, you've got this wrong. This is the wrong assignment. And that was my best in show letter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a new grandson on the oh. 1st of October about. Congratulations. My oldest grandchild is just starting university, and my youngest one's I, and I have now the rounded out to the half dozen. Wow. So doing well in that part also. Well, congratulations to both of you. That's, that's amazing. Well, well, thank you, sir. Thanks for giving us your time today. I really appreciate it. I know you're, you're uh, getting ready for 
whatever he and I know you're not doing lots of work around there that's why you had to time it the way we are now so yeah, that's it and I actually and I was babysitting yesterday and babysitting again on Friday I do need you to send me the link for this sometime because my daughter strange enough wants to see how badly I behave <laughs> okay okay I will definitely send it to her <laughs> okay thank you for the opportunity <laughs> thank you Mr. Reynolds as it is a pleasure as always it's great to see you can't wait to see you in person right same here <laughs> Bye bye now. Bye bye. Well, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. It was great to see you. Great to catch up. Can't wait to see you at a dog show. If you like what you're seeing here, press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com or go right to willalexander.net to find out exactly what's happening in Will's world. Take care.